for, uh, for me to introduce um, one of uh, our stars, Sandia Murthy, who is uh, assistant professor of medicine and director of our pulmonary hypertension center, uh, came to Monty in originally in 2005 when she did her internship and uh, cardiology fellowship. Uh, then she went to Colombia where she uh, did her training in advanced heart failure and uh, we were uh, very fortunate to recruit her back in 2015. In addition to her role as a member of the section of heart failure and uh, car cardiac transplantation, she has been uh, one of the uh, leading figures uh, in uh, pulmonary hypertension, has developed uh, the pulmonary hypertension program at our center. Uh, she has developed a team that established a multidisciplinary approach for thrombectomy, uh, lung transplantation when appropriate. Uh, she follows right now more than 500 patients and she has developed very sophisticated protocols for analysis of the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, their relationship in pulmonary hypertension using uh, advanced imaging techniques, including MRI, stress echo, uh, complex hemodynamic assessment, uh, some of them uh, requiring exercise or exercise challenge. Uh, in fact, before she starts, I want to take this, this opportunity to um, uh, announce uh, a uh, program that we have uh, available uh, that we'll be starting here, which is complementary to um, Dr. Murthy's program. Uh, it's going to be essential. Uh, for a uh, patient with pulmonary hypertension. We are the only uh, lab in the region that will be offering supine bike uh, stress echo, uh, and that will be done at our Hodge Metro Center uh, campus. Um, this is uh, a very important tool. Um, this is a, a view of the um, device that is used to acquire the images. It's a bed that can be inclined at different angles, rotated, where the patient can uh, exercise uh, by pedaling uh, at incremental workloads while echo images are recorded simultaneously. And that's a key that we can do complex assessment of left ventricular and right ventricular function as well as uh, hemodynamics uh, with Doppler uh, to measure changes in pulmonary pressures during exercise, which is important to patients in whom the diagnosis is clear or in whom we're trying to uh, evaluate uh, for unexplained symptoms. Uh, it is a tool that is not only important for patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension, but it's also very useful in patients with uh, mitral valve or aortic valve disease of uncertain severity, uh, patients in, in whom there is uh, shortness of breath uh, um, that is disproportionate to what we see on a resting echo, uh, and uh, in patients with heart failure with preserved rejection fraction. So um, after uh, this, I would like to introduce uh, Sandia uh, Murthy. Uh, and Sandia, uh, welcome to this series, and we're looking forward to hear your talk. Thank you very much, Mario. I'm very excited about the supine bike. That's going to be very key in, in evaluating some of these sick patients. So I'm going to hope to give you an overview. Let's see if we can start sharing my screen here. All right, there's a second. Give me one second. Try to bring this up. Over, overview of the uh, of pH as it stands in 2020. Okay. 
All right, so I like to start always with kind of a historical context. This is really the beginning of invasive hemodynamics um, and, and the whole field. This is a 24 year old medical student, actually fresh out of medical school named uh, Werner Forsman in, in Germany. And he was obsessed with the idea of being able to access the central pressures from a peripheral location. So he actually convinced one of the nurses that he worked with to help him catheterize himself essentially. So he, he basically, he took a urinary catheter, which if you think about it, looks very similar to a swan. So uh, he entered his left brachial vein and walked himself down to radiology. And with the help of fluoroscopy was, fluoroscopy was able to actually show and prove to the world for the first time that you're able to, to reach directly into the heart from, from this peripheral location and it was safe to do. So of course he was fired right after this um, for his insubordinance, but really this lay the foundation for what was to come next. The next really important concept that evolved was in, in the 1940s. And this is the whole idea of hypoxic vasoconstriction, which is extremely important when we think about therapies. So it's, it's the idea that, and, and the pulmonologists know this very well, but the, the lungs respond to hypoxia in a very different way than most other tissues do in the sense that they will vasoconstrict in response to hypoxia. And what's interesting about this is within minutes of hypoxia, the lung pressures go up. And even when you restore normoxia, it can take some time for the pressures to actually come back down to uh, normal. So this is kind of the first time we understood that the lungs are a separate circuit that are, are separate from the systemic circuit. So the next step in all of this, you know, logically would be to think about therapies and can we actually change the pressures in the lungs? And this is the first documented uh, paper about actually, uh, you know, uh, targeting and treating lung pressures. So this is a patient probably with congenital disease. And I say that just because of these, you know, enormously high PA pressures, um, a young, young man uh, with a mean pressure of about 46 and blood pressure of about 96. And after administration of priscoline, which is kind of a derivative of acetylcholine, um, after a certain number of minutes, he was able to drop his mean PA pressure to about 31. And this was the first time you showed that, hey, you know, there's high pressures in the lungs that are separate from the systemic circuit that we can actually treat and potentially bring down. So it wasn't until the 1950s that the art of the, of the swan Gans catheter really came about. And this is uh, Andre Cornand and, uh, and Richards out of Columbia uh, won the Nobel prize along with Forsman um, about 20 some years after he originally did this that uh, were able to, to actually uh, get the technique down and, and they were credited with being the pioneers in invasive hemodynamics. And of course, we have to mention Paul Wood. So everybody talks about the Wood unit as the way we speak about pulmonary vascular resistance, but he's credited with being the first person to actually define the, the normal PA pressure. What's the upper limit? And importantly, he studied acetylcholine, which is probably a more appropriate pulmonary vasodilator because it's all, um, it's, it's destroyed through first pass in the lungs. So there's really no systemic effect. So giving acetylcholine and targeting the pulmonary vasculature was the first time that he really proved that the pulmonary circuit is separate from the systemic circuit and that it can be manipulated. Um, he actually died in, in his 50s of an, of an MI and after he, he refused to uh, be resuscitated and he didn't wanna live without his full fat facilities. So he left at an early age, but cer certainly contributed enormous amount of information to the field. Okay. so. It wasn't until the 70s before people really started paying attention where there was this fad about, you know, young women um, trying to lose weight with, with uh, uh, aminorex and these derivatives of fenfen, basically. Um, in the 1960s, this was like the Life magazine cover about dangerous diet pills and this trend that women were coming in dying of pulmonary hypertension unbeknownst at the time, but the only thing that they had in common was their exposure to diet supplements. So that was really kind of what sparked the whole interest in the field. This brings us up to the 1970s when there was the first uh, WHO symposium on pulmonary hypertension. And this, this 
meeting really just established that yes, this is something that exists, which was a great first step. But again, it stood dormant for about the next 10, 15 years until the second PHF epidemic when FenFen was approved. And then we started to see this whole, uh, but uh, several women coming in with valvular myopathies as well as pul pulmonary hypertension. That was time for a second World Health Symposium. And since the, 1990, since the late 1990s, essentially every five years, the experts have been meeting to develop nomenclature, come up with a common language, and finally take it back to where it affects the cardiologists, which is really the right heart. So uh, the last symposium was held two years ago where uh, the biggest thing out of that was really redefining the hemodynamic limits of pulmonary hypertension, which we'll get to in a minute. So I like to kind of look at the slide and say, you know, this is a very new disease, really, if you think about it, it hasn't really evolved since the 1990s. 1990s was really when things started happening. So it is a very new disease that we're still learning quite a bit about. So uh, regardless of what the cause is, the Increased P PVR causes a couple things. One is that you um, have this kind of abnormal coagulopathy that happens in the distal vessels. And so you can have in situ thrombosis, you can have remod remodeling. And, and then, so the sustained vasoconstriction actually propagates this process. All of this will uh, end in RV dysfunction. And this is really the ultimate cause of death in all pulmonary hypertension patients. And this is why as cardiologists we're involved with this because ultimately they will all die of RV failure if untreated. So in the beginning, as I said, in 1973, when this was recognized as being a clinical entity, there was really two types that we cared about. One was primary and then it was secondary. So thankfully it has gotten a lot more complicated and, 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 you know, um, and detailed since then. But it's basically what this is implying is that there's either a lung problem or this is a secondary to some other problem that's affecting the lungs. So how, how does a disease get characterized as PAH? Um, back then, it was all basically histology that we would look at. And, and if you were a pulmonary arterial hypertension patient, the, regardless of the cause, the histology was identical. Basically, you'd have this uh, endothelial pro proliferation, you'd have fibrosis of the intima, and then of course there's sm smooth muscle hypertrophy. So this was kind of the classic findings you would see regardless of cause of pulmonary hypertension. In the more advanced stages, you'll see uh, thrombosis as well as fibrosis. And then these, these lesions are called plexiform lesions. These are really the lungs way of trying to increase the surface area for more gas exchange. So this is what you see kind of later on in the disease. But regardless of cause, again, you're categorized as having pulmonary arterial hypertension if this histology holds true. So in 2018, and this is kind of what I wanna spend a little time on because this is very important in, in trying to understand how we diagnose and how we go about treating this, is group one is pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is really the lung problem. So we, we have idiopathic, which is you know the classic scenario of a 30-year-old young woman coming in short of breath the heritable form, which is the genetic subtype. It's been associated with this BMPR2 mutation, but it's a little bit unclear whether this is, you know, this is the only thing involved because about 20% of the idiopathic people also carry the BMPR2 mutation. So it may just be an innocent bystander. So there's really, I say that just to say there's no role for genetic testing in PAH as of yet. Um, next, you can have PAH from connective tissue disease, things like lupus, scleroderma, um, portal pulmonary hypertension, which is seen in cirrhotic patients. HIV causes pulmonary hypertension. Um, it's very rare, but you see it at about 0.04% of HIV patients will have PAH, which is at least eightfold higher than the normal population. So there's some association with exposure to the virus causing this vasculopathy. Um, there's the congenital patients, which is the, you know, congenital right to left shunts and uh, chronic right to left shunts from Eisenmengers and things like that. There's schistosomiasis, which is the most common cause worldwide. I can't say that I've seen a single case here, but this, this is the most common case worldwide of, of pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary vein occlusive disease is a very rare, but it's caused by distal scarring of the veins and is characterized by hypoxia. 
There's persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, which is caused by maternal SSRI use, not, not so much anything to do with the newborn. Um, and then there's the drug and toxin category. So again, why are all of these associated conditions lumped into pulmonary arterial hypertension? It's because they all share the same histology that we talked about earlier. So the drugs, we of course have the first three here are all the diet supplements, Aminorex, Fenfen, Dexflen, Fluoramine. These are all have been shown to be uh, definite causes of PAH. Toxic rapeseed oil is a synthetic version of rapeseed oil, which is actually the world's most common vegetable oil. Um, but in, in the 80s, there was some company that made the synthetic grade of rapeseed oil and sold it off as canola oil. And this toxic kind of combination led to a lot of pulmonary hypertension. You won't see it in the, on the stores now, so don't worry about that. Um, Benflurex is also a diet supplement. And SSRI, again, this is about the newborn. So SSRI and maternal use can cause uh, newborn pulmonary hypertension. Possible things that we're starting to see, cocaine. Cocaine does a lot to the lungs um, and pulmonary hypertension is, is possibly one of them. Uh, there's some chemotherapy agents, interferons, most likely, and, and something we see quite a bit is the methamphetamine use leading to pulmonary hypertension. And although there's a female predominance of idiopathic pH, estrogen has never really been shown to, to be uh, contributing to this. Okay, I'm just gonna run through the, 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 the other four categories because the treatment for these diseases really is uh, hinges on the underlying cause. So pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease, obviously that's systolic, diastolic, valvular heart disease, um, anything that increases your LA pressure essentially. Um, pulmonary hypertension due to lung diseases or hypoxia is probably one of the most common causes we see here, uh, COPD, uh, emphysema, obstructive sleep apnea, um, ILD, these kind of uh, lung, primary lung pathologies are grouped in and they're characterized by hypoxia. Um, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is the only except, this is the exception to the rule that none of these other subcategories are treated with pH therapy because there is one therapy that's approved for CTEF. Um, and this is basically chronic, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is curative with a, a thrombectomy, but not, not all patients are, are um, candidates for that. So there's one therapy that we use. Um, it is diagnosed with a VQ scan. Basically a negative VQ scan essentially rules this out. Um, and uh, most patients that have it really don't have any history of pulmonary, uh, of, of, of thromboembolic phenomenon. So it's a very important thing to look for because it's easily missed. Um, finally, the wastebasket uh, category is pulmonary hypertension with unclear mechanisms. Things that we see a lot here is chronic kidney disease. It does a lot to the lungs and especially dialysis patients, high flow. There's several different postulations as to why patients on dialysis have pH. Sarcoidosis is a big one. Um, sarcoidosis does many things to the lung, one of them being pulmonary hypertension, also ILD type phenotype. So there's a couple other things here in the wastebasket category. So I'm gonna talk about the first registry data because unfortunately since the 1980s, a lot of this still holds true. So it, I think it's very uh, important that we kind of talk about this. So uh, this is the first kind of registry um, data, 192 patients, 32 centers in the US. It was done over a uh, course of three years. And importantly, it was done before therapy. But as I said, a lot of it still holds true. So this was the survival that was back then, again, in the era where there was really no therapy options. At one year, about 68% are, are surviving. At three years, about 43% or so. And at five years, about 38% are, are, are surviving. So this is a, a pretty abysmal, but unfortunately not so much better now. Um, what else we learned from this is that, and this still holds true, is that connective tissue disease patients like the scleroderma patients, especially diffuse systemic sclerosis, they have the worst survival regardless of therapy. Um, next, if you're NYHA class four or WHO functional group four, you have the worst survival. Um, if your right atrial pressure is over 20, th those patients are dead within six months, which is, which is incredible to think about how important prognostically that is. 
And the cardiac index, if it's less than two, you're dead with, within a year. So what these last two are looking at is really RV function, if you think about it. This is really just markers of how sick your RV is. So the diagnostic al algorithm quickly, um, ideally you're gonna suspect this clinically by you know, a patient coming in complaining of shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion, um, and you may see some cardiomegaly on the chest X-ray, some prominent pulmonary vasculature, you get an echocardiogram and what you're doing with the echocardiogram is you're ruling out that group two disease. You're basically looking for valvular disease. You're looking for left atrial size that would tell you that of some, any kind of diastolic dysfunction, of course, systolic dysfunction, you're ruling it out. Next, you wanna focus on the group three phenotype. So you'll get PFTs. You'll get a sleep study if, if it's warranted, if they, they have a positive questionnaire. A VQ scan, as I said, is mandatory pretty much for everybody because you, you never want to miss CTEF as causing this. The last thing is you can consider a CAT scan with high resolution if you hear crackles, you're worried about ILD, anything like that. So we're ruling out all of these possible etiologies with these tests. Then finally, you want to hone in on the group one subtypes. So you look at the autoimmune panel, the HIV test, the LFTs, hepatitis panel, if, if appropriate. And, and you're looking for these group one specific uh, illnesses. Finally, all roads kind of lead to the right heart catheterization, which is really the gold standard in diagnosing this. So our hemodynamic evaluation now is done through two approaches, either the right IJ, or um, I've been doing a lot of the brachial vein access, just like they did in 1929, because I find it safer for the patients. And it's really just um, you know, going in through, through the right atrium, which, and then eventually our right ventricle through the PA and then wedge, which would represent the left atrial pressure. Now this only works because this is one long circuit, one continuous circuit. So we use the wedge pressure to approximate the distal pressure, which is the left atrium. So, um, the hemodynamic definition now as of 2018 is that pulmonary hy hypertension is all forms of pulmonary hypertension is, is defined as a mean PA over 20. And you wanna further distinguish that is, is it arterial or is it venous? And that really depends on the wedge pressure. So a wedge pressure of under 15, that's pulmonary arterial hypertension. If there's a wedge pressure over 15, that's more likely to be pulmonary venous hypertension. I wish it were that simple. There's a lot of overlap and, and it, it can get uh, a little bit complex. Um, so. In a perfect world, let's talk about normal hemodynamics first. Um, PA diastolic will equal the wedge, will equal the LA, will equal the LVEDP. Again, this is a big, long circuit. So all these pressures should translate somewhat perfectly. So an average RA is about five. Next, we come into our first pumping chamber and that's the RV and we, we get a pressure about 20 over five. So these are nice normal numbers. Then we make our way to the PA and what we see is a diastolic step up. Um, so the 20 uh, over 10 with a mean of 15. So remember this mean pressure is really what defines pulmonary hypertension. So nice and normal. And the rationale for the mean PA being over 20 as being abnormal is that really normal people have an average mean PA of about 14. So two standard deviations about 20. So 20 is really thought to be abnormal. Um, and remember this PA diastolic should equal the wedge pressure, which equals the left atrial pressure. So this is 10, the left atrial pressure. Note the relationship between the RA and the LA. The RA is always lower than the left atrium. So this is a nice normal relationship of all the cardiac chambers. So now let's look for abnormal states. This is the classic pulmonary arterial or precapillary hypertension. All of these words are are used interchangeably just to drive everybody crazy, but pre-capillary means pulmonary arterial hypertension. So we get to an RA and we note, hey, it's a little bit high, 15. Then the RV, now we're starting to see real pressures, 90 over 15. And classically pulmonary arterial hypertension, these patients do generate much higher pressures. And then we go into the PA and we get a pressure of 90 over 30 with a mean of 40. So anything over 40 is severe pulmonary hypertension. And finally, you get a wedge pressure of 15. Now, anybody who's paying attention will say, hey, well, 
how come the 30 doesn't equal the 15? I thought you said the PA diastolic should equal the wedge. I'm introducing a concept here called diastolic pressure gradient, which has gotten a lot of buzz over the last couple of years. Now, the whole idea is that in severe pulmonary arterial hypertension or precapillary hypertension, there's a disconnect between the PA diastolic and the wedge. And this is thought to be due to a lot of this vascular uncoupling phenomenon that happens. So suddenly the RV and the PAs are not talking to each other. And so this is the exception to, to when I say that the PA diastolic should always equal left-sided pressure there. In, in severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, that's not the case. In fact, this has been shown to be a poor prognostic indicator when you see a diastolic pressure gradient like this. But overall, the bigger point here is the mean PA is 40, very high it's not driven by the left atrial pressure. The left atrial pressure is only 15. Okay, so contrast that with post-capillary hypertension, also called pulmonary venous hypertension. You have similarly elevated LA pre RA pressure. You have a RV pressure of 60 over 20, still on the higher side. You have a PA pressure of 60 over 35 with a mean of 40. Notice it's the same mean PA pressure, still severe pulmonary hypertension, but the difference here is the wedge is 35. So basically the wedge of 35 or the left atrial pressure of 35 is driving this pulmonary hypertension. So this is also you know, what we call transpulmonary gradient, which is the difference, the, the difference in the pressure across the lung beds. So this is kind of how we, we separate these patients into two clinical profiles. Is this pre-capillary, is this post-capillary? And then we can focus on the treatments for this. So there's a couple of other reasons that we do the hemodynamic evaluation. And again, because I told you that, that NHLBI data from 1981 still holds true. It's that increased RA pressure is a bad sign. Decreased cardiac index is a bad sign, and an increased mean PA pressure of over 40 is also a bad sign. So they're, they're, they've consistently shown across the years that these predict death. So that's really the other part of doing this, and then also to determine treatment. So we're not done with the uh, hemodynamics until, and in a select group of patients, we, we go on to do a vasodilator challenge. So what we do is we administer a pulmonary vasodilator and look at the effect on the pulmonary artery pressures. So again, you're gonna do this on patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. On the patients with pulmonary venous hypertension, this does not apply. You would, would not wanna do this uh, on, on patients who have any other etiology other than pulmonary arterial hypertension. So you have a mean PA over 20, you have a wedge under 15. You give them a vasodilator. You have your choice of nitric oxide. You can use IV buprocinol. You can use IV adenosine. For practical purposes, it's just easy to deliver. We do inhale nitric oxide. And what we're trying to look for is a drop in the mean PA of 10 to a mean under 40 without any increase in wedge or any decrease in cardiac output. So you're looking for that mean PA to drop by 10. So what does that mean? So a lot of studies show that uh, basically the original studies that looked at this they used calcium channel blockers, not nitric oxide. Um, and calcium channel blockers basically will do smooth muscle relaxation. And they found a subset of patients that actually responded really well to high dose calcium channel blockade. So I'm talking about 170 milligrams of nifedipine or 360 milligrams of diltiazem or 720 milligrams of diltiazem rather. So really huge doses of calcium channel blockers four hours later in the cat lab, eventually a subset of these patients actually responded. So obviously we're not gonna do this in the cath lab. So we use nitric oxide as kind of a screening tool. So being a responder to nitric oxide, what that tells you is that you should put these patients on high dose calcium channel blockers, really high doses, and they will do well. So this is really where this comes from. In 1992, they did just this study. They found that the responders were put on 720 milligrams of diltiazem going forward and their five-year survival was 95% near normal versus historical controls who were non-survivors. Remember we said their five-year survival was somewhere 40%, 38%. So what this, what this kind of led to is that if you find those people, those lucky people that respond, you put them on high dose calcium channel blockers, they'll be fine. With the caveat, this is not randomized. We don't know whether calcium channel blockers have anything to do with the survival versus it's just the fact that they're responsive that they do better anyway. Okay, so who should get a nitric oxide challenge? In 2018, what, you know, now what, in the latest, uh, latest WHO symposium, 
what we realize is a lot of people, number one, don't tolerate high dose calcium channel blockers and it doesn't work for all classes. So what we do know is drug induced patients, idiopathic and hereditary patients generally do very well with calcium channel blockers if they're nitric oxide responsive. But you wanna think about who sh shouldn't get it, about who will not tolerate high dose calcium channel blockers. Basically, these are all directly negative inotropic patients. So if you have borderline blood pressure, if your cardiac index is low, if you're bradycardic, you're not gonna put that person on high dose calcium channel blockers no matter what, because these are centrally acting calcium channel blockers. It's not like Norvasc. Um, so you, you really wanna pick the right patients to do it in um, and think about what the implications of a nitric oxide challenge are before you do it. Um, and then in the mixed connective tissue disease people, they really just don't do well with this, uh, with calcium channel blockers. So in general, I don't even do them on the mixed connective tissue disease patients. So 5% respond, about 95% don't respond. So then what? So then we go down our three classic pathways um, and everybody's probably seen this who's ever gone to any pH talk, but this is basically the three pathways that are targeted on the pulmonary vasculature. So we have the endothelin pathway, the nitric oxide pathway, and the process cycling pathway. And all of these things are geared towards vasodilation, vasoconstriction of the pulmonary artery. So we'll talk about each one very quickly. So uh, the endothelin pathway, it's a potent vasoconstrictor, uh, 100 times more potent than norepinephrine. In all forms of pulmonary hypertension, actually, endothelin levels are increased, but more so in PAH. We have three options for endothelins. We have bocentan, ambrosentan, and masatentan. Their only difference is how, uh, how much affinity they have to the ETA receptor. ETA is abundant in the lungs. Um, ETA and ETB are found throughout the body, especially the liver. Um, bocentan and ambrosentan both have been shown to improve six minute walk by about 20 meters at 12 weeks. That's the data behind those two. Masatentan has a little bit stronger data about uh, the need for escalation of therapy and things like that. Practically speaking, nobody really uses bocentan anymore because of the hepatotoxicity. With the later versions of the endothelin receptor antagonist, the, you don't have to worry about the liver so much because the, they're, more, um, they're more affinity towards the ETA receptor, which is really in the lungs. So ambrosentin and masatentin are practically the only two uh, endothelin receptor antagonists that we use. The nitric oxide pathway, uh, probably everybody's heard of sildenafil, tadalafil as, as potential treatments, but this is how it works. This is, the this is the vascular lumen. The first thing that happens when there's sheer stress from pulmonary hypertension, either high flow, high pressures, nitric oxide synthetase is uh, stimulated and that causes nitric oxide to be produced. Nitric oxide diffuses through the endothelial cell into the smooth muscles and activates cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP is the thing, that's the vasodilator. That's what's where the money is. So this causes direct vasodilation. So if you think about it, you, when you give sildenafil um, or tadalafil, you're, that's basically a PDE5 inhibitor. What does PDE5 do? PDE5 breaks down cyclic GMP. So when you're, when you're blocking the thing that breaks it down, you have more cyclic GMP hanging around, but you still need nitric oxide to work in order to activate cyclic GMP. This is where Rio Sigwat or, or the stimulator of guanylyl cyclase comes in. So this actually directly uh, stimulates cyclic GMP. So you have the Tadalafil and Sildenafil working at this level. You have the Rio Sigwat working at this level, which is actually a direct stimulator of this. So the end result is, is the same on both. You, you have basal relaxation. So process cyclin therapy is important because it is the only class of medicine that has any mortality data behind it. Everything else is about six minute walk distance and things like that, but process cyclin data, and this is the original data from 1996, and it's hold, it still holds true that this is IV process cyclins. At the end of 12 weeks, they found that 40%, 40 patients that took process cyclins, all 100% were alive versus 80% in the conventional therapy arm, which was basically, you know, calcium, not calcium channel blockers if appropriate, or, you know, uh, Coumadin and digoxin, that was all that was available at the time. But 
Um, basically, it is the only mortality uh, drug that we have for pulmonary arterial hypertension, even 30 years later. So that's really it with the drugs. They, they have three major pathways, the endothelial and nitric oxide and prostacycline pathways. And in the prostacycline pathways, again, this is the only mortality drugs we have, but only the IV form. The inhaled and the oral prostacyclines have not been shown to have the same robust mortality data. And of course, all of these don't have any mortality data. It's really just six minute walk in functional class and things like that. So this is the timeline. Um, I'm waiting to add something after 2015, but there hasn't been anything yet. So Celexapag, which is an oral uh, prostacyclin uh, receptor antagonist is, is the last thing added to this. And, uh, but since then, if you look at the timeline, it's really just 14 drugs and 20 randomized controlled trials. That's, that's what we got. So how do you decide what, who gets what um, and when, when do you start therapy? Well, we look at risk score. Risk score is really important now. And there's been a lot of um, literature lately on, on, on refining the risk score. This is the ERS um, ESC guideline risk scores. And basically it groups patients into low risk, intermediate risk and high risk. And this is mortality within a year. So low risk have a mortality of less than 5% a year whereas the high risk have over a 10% of the year. And if you look at the things that they combine, they combine clinical characteristics like right heart failure, progression of symptoms and syncope. There's also functional classes. So like uh, six minute walk distance, CPET testing, and then there's imaging and blood levels. So BNP is very important. We have cardiac MRI or echocardiogram looking at dimensions of the right side. And finally, importantly, hemodynamics. Hemodynamics are huge still. So remember that right atrial pressure and the cardiac index. Again, all signs of RV failure. So your, your job in the clinic is really to kind of put in your mind, how, how risky is this patient? What is their risk status? And from then we can kind of decide on therapy. The, obviously the high risk patients, there's no question. They will get IV prostacyclines. The low and intermediate risks, get combinations of double and triple therapy. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then you wanna do this every single time they come into the clinic to try to uh, bring their risk score down to low. And we, we track six minute walk distance, which is easily done you know, in any clinic as a way to, to track and escalate therapy appropriately. So in 2015, there was a trial called the Ambition Trial. And this really kind of changed the way we, we gave therapy, basically they took 500 patients that were not treated at all forever for, for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So these are all new, newly diagnosed patients. And they put them on a combination of either ambrosentan alone, tadalafil alone, or ambrosentan and tadalafil together. So this is an ERA and a PD-5 inhibitor. So the combination therapy was far better than single therapy alone in, in uh, the reduction uh, in clinical failure, meaning that those patients didn't have to escalate therapy to IV. They had better six minute walk distance. They had improvement in pro BNP. So from that standpoint, we generally, we never really start monotherapy. It's always gonna be a combination of a PD-5 and an ERA. And kind of, I, I think about this like I think about heart failure in the sense that you would never just start a beta blocker. You wanna kind of attack this thing from all angles. You would do the beta blocker, you would do the RAS inhibition, um, spironolactone and things like that. So this is kind of the same, in the same vein, you wanna block all three pathways and target all three pathways. And so two is, two is certainly better than one. So another thing to think about with therapy and, and not, not everybody, and people, some patients may never reach low risk category, um, but so you wanna keep evaluating what is their risk category and try to escalate the therapy as much as possible. We have 14 different choices and I always say, we'll find the right combination to get the patients to where they need to be, which is you know improving six minute walk and things like that. We have a lot of risk calculators available. I find that the ERS ESC risk score is, is relatively easy to look at and quickly done in the clinic in, in, in real life. But uh, the reveal is also very comprehensive and probably the most accurate, the Compara and French BNP is for four to six characteristics that we can easily ca calculate. So the important thing is just to use one and, and try to, to stay consistent. I do wanna talk about surgical options. Um, the, they range from everything from atrial septostomy to lung transplant. So um, 
atrial septostomy we'll talk about in a second. Lung transplant also we'll talk about, and it's, uh, it's not done often for PAH, but uh, because of we have all these therapies available, but it is an option. ECMO and RVED. So I put a question mark with RVED because I think this is really where this is going. Because as I told you, everybody will die of RV failure. There are no uh, permanent devices that you can go home with for RV support. So currently, uh, ECMO and RVED are generally used as a bridge to something. So I, we would never just do that without a, without a plan B, a backup plan. CTEF, so remember, this is the only surgically cured disease. So the pulmonary endarterectomy is the uh, procedure of choice to remove all distal clots. Now, this is a very nuanced thing. It's not that there's one big centrally occlusive thrombus. There's uh, several peripheral thrombi that, that lead to this. Um, so it, it should be done in a very experienced center. Um, and once done correctly, these patients are generally cured. The pulmonary pressures come down almost instantly. Atrial septostomy. Now the rationale was that, you know, patients that were waiting for lung transplants did better if they had a PFO. And this is kind of where the first hint that perhaps this was a, a way to buy time. And basically what you're doing is you're creating a hole in the atria so that there's more flow that goes right to left so that you have more cardiac output albeit you're more uh, deoxygenated, but it's, it's a way of preserving your cardiac output. And again, this is either palliative or it's as a bridge to something. Um, there's not much data behind it, but certainly there's an immediate hemodynamic effect. You will lower your RA pressure. You will improve your cardiac index with a lower oxygen saturation. Again, lung transplant not performed that often for PAH and probably because there's other, there's, there's medical therapies that we can use. And with IV prostacyclines, we've actually had a lot of uh, success in delaying um, lung transplant. So the survival, uh, the three month mortality right after lung transplant is the highest for this group. Usually bilateral lung transplants performed more. Um, and then there's a high, there's a high mortality waiting on the list for a lung transplant. But the key here is to refer early. Once patients are on IV prostacyclines, that's generally when I start to think about this as an option to, to get the ball rolling early. Um, and again, if the patient kind of makes it through one year uh, after transplant, their 10 year survival is similar to other lung transplant patients. So it's really the first year that we worry about as far as lower survival with these patients. And that's probably just because they're referred very late with advanced RV failure and things like that. Okay, so I wanted to end, that was a whirlwind kind of overview of, of the field as we have it, but I wanted to kind of give you a real life, you know, case of, of stuff that we go through in the clinic. This is a case we saw recently of a 70 year old lady. She was a former heavy smoker and she quit recently. She also has HIV, she's on heart therapy. She's had it for 25 years. Um, hepatitis C, uh, she was treated for that. And also she has some history of breast cancer with, with mastectomy and hormone therapy. And she also had this cirrhotic appearing liver by imaging. So I'm, I'm framing this in the sense of these are all the risk factors for pulmonary hypertension. These are all things that we can see uh, attributing to it. So it's, it's up to us now to kind of dissect out exactly what's causing her clinical scenario. So she presented with RB failure. And I don't even need to play this for you guys to appreciate that this is not the way the RV should look. The right side should be about two thirds the size of the LV. This is basically a pancaked LV, this huge right side. This is a Doppler through the tricuspid valve. And this is kind of how we estimate pulmonary pressures through an echo. Here, the, the estimated pulmonary pressures are severely elevated, almost 100. So 100 millimeters of mercury. So this is severely high uh, pulmonary pressures as estimated by echocardiogram. And this is kind of the screening test of choice that we, we use to start everything. So then we begin the workup trying to figure out exactly which one of these pathologies or pre-existing conditions are contributing to this. The VQ, which is mandatory for everybody, is negative. Abdominal ultrasound confirmed the cirrhotic appearing liver. The bubble study is negative. So again, this is important when you think about right to left shunts and any other high flow kind of scenarios or any kind of pulmonary ABMs as well. The other thing to note is although she has a heavy history of smoking, the FEV1 is 74%, so not terrible. Um, and uh, just a word on emphysema and COPD, 
yes, it can cause pulmonary hypertension. It's exceedingly rare to have severe pulmonary hypertension with emphysema and COPD. So the other thing to show is that the, we did a CAT scan, she had large PAs, but no ILD. So then I'm thinking, well, you know, what are the possible causes? Could this be emphysema or hypoxic lung disease? Is this just hypoxic vasoconstriction? So that's group three disease, not something necessarily I could treat with my medicines. Is this HIV? That's group one, that's very treatable. So that might be something. Or is this cirrhosis related? Meaning is this portal pulmonary hypertension or hepatal pulmonary hypertension? Hepatal pulmonary, I don't think so because the bubble study was negative. I don't think there's any pulmonary AVMs. But portal pulmonary is a very realistic option in, in someone who had hep C and evidence of cirrhosis by imaging. So we have to demonstrate that there's portal hypertension. And that's also group one. So I have a couple different etiologies that I could potentially treat here. So again, all roads end in right heart catheterization. So this is her hemodynamics. Her RA was 12, a bit elevated, but not terrible. We get into the RV, we see a pressure of 90 over 12 already. There's a problem here. We go into the PA, it's 90 over 40 with a mean of 59, severely elevated, almost systemic pressures. Her blood pressure, by the way, is 130s over something. So this is about two thirds systemic. The wedge pressure is six. So again, two things to know here. One, look at that diastolic pressure gradient that we talked about. So that's a very poor prognostic sign here. Um, and then this is clearly not a heart thing. This is a lung thing just by these hemodynamics. Her cardiac output and index are low, suggesting kind of advanced RV failure. Her oxygen stat is a little bit borderline too. It's not terrible. Usually you need a stat of 92 or under before you get the hypoxic phase of constriction, but it's a consideration. So with these patients, I always do an oxygen study and just give them oxygen, bump it up to hundred and see what happens. And I can tell you with her, nothing really happened. So then I, I, we go on and say, well, this could be, you know, group one HIV related. Let's do an inhaled nitric oxide, even though um, I just told you, I probably wouldn't put her on high dose calcium channel blockers because of her index, but we did it and nothing really happened. So she's, uh, she's a non-responder and significantly elevated PA pressures. So I really haven't answered the questions. Could this be the, the is this HIV? I don't think it's emphysema related because it's, uh, she didn't really respond very well to oxygen. She doesn't have significant uh, PFT defects. So I don't really buy that it's group three disease. At this point, I'm thinking maybe it's HIV related, PAH versus maybe this has to do with the cirrhotic liver thing. So in the same setting, we kind of go right down to the liver. Instead of going to the heart, we, we go south and, and hit the liver and we, we check the pressures across the liver bed. So we have a hepatic vein of 14 and a hepatic wedge of 15, which gives us a gradient of one. So this is not portal hypertension. Uh, you need a portal systemic gradient of at least five or above to call it portal hypertension. Without portal hypertension, there is no portal pulmonary hypertension. So we've essentially ruled that out. So in the end of the day, this is probably HIV related uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is actually not terrible because we have treatments for this. So what do we treat her with? I think, you know, just clinical picture, looking at the hemodynamics, looking at the cardiac output, she certainly seems that she would be in the, uh, inter, in, into the high risk category. Um, and of course we followed it up with a clinic that confirmed six minute walk is certainly very low. We did a CPET on her, pro BNP was elevated. So all of these things put her in the high risk category. So for her, there was really not much of a debate about this. We would put her on uh, IV prostacyclines and that's, that's what we did. Um, so how do we track progress right now? You know, this is really the, the, the kind of very exciting part is how do we, how do we match our technology with our, our therapies for our patients? This is the CardioMEM device. This is a sensor that goes into the PA artery and it's placed at the same time as a swan and the patients go home with the pillow and are able to transmit pulmonary pressures and uh, you know, as often as you ask them to. So there was a, a landmark kind of paper a couple years ago that looked at this just for this population and it was safe and uh, it was done in a number, it was an, N an NHB, NHLBI uh, funded study that really um, established that you can use the CardioMEM safely to, to monitor PA pressures uh, in this population. So that's what we did. We implanted the CardioMEMs. 
This was her in the beginning. Don't worry, they're not this high right now, but you can see that it gives you a nice PA tracing. It's, uh, it captures the data for over 15 seconds and it transmits uh, through Wi-Fi. And we're able to kind of track our patients the best this way. And using this information plus frequent clinic follow-ups, we follow them very closely. And she's doing very well on IV process cyclin therapy and uh, we're escalating uh, as, as she tolerates it. So that's, uh, that's what I kind of wanted to end at. And I'll be happy to take any questions now. I appreciate your time and, uh, and, and your interest in this very, very exciting topic for me at least. Well, thank you, Sandia, for uh, a really tour de force, wonderful, complete presentation. And thank you for staying on time. Uh, so we can uh, uh, ask a few questions. As I uh, remind the uh, participants here, uh, you can uh, type your question in the chat uh, function uh, on Zoom, and I will uh, read them to Dr. Murthy. Um, as I am uh, waiting for some of them, I have a few. I have um, already several ideas for a uh, cardiovascular medicine board, uh, which we always have to add new questions. Um, so fellows uh, here, please uh, pay attention to this conference because um, the board is gonna be heavily influenced by our speakers. Um, the first question I have for you, you mentioned that RV failure is uh, basically the cause of death of many of these patients. And I, and I always wonder, is RV failure the cause of death or is just a manifestation or severely increased afterload that uh, uh, at that point has become uh, the, the, major, the major cause of mortality? In other words, can you really affect uh, mortality by treating uh, RV failure on its own? Yeah, so I think this is all, you know, the RV issue is really fascinating. And I think I can try to tackle this with just lung transplant data, because again, you know, most of these patients that get to the lung transplant stage have advanced RV dysfunction. And what we're treating with a lung transplant is basically dropping the afterload. And what we've learned about the RV is that it is extremely plastic, unlike the left ventricle, which takes a lot of time to recover. And even when you drop the afterload to the left ventricle, it's, it's sluggish and more like an intrinsic myopathy. But it's very, you know, the RV failure to, to me, I think about it as the direct consequence to, to high afterload, chronically high afterload. Now, at some point, I imagine it is a reversible, for, but for the most part, in all the lung transplant data, where they take the sickest patients with severe RV dysfunction. In, in Europe, they never do heart lung transplants. They always do just lung transplants. And in general, what we learned is with some coaxing, the RV always comes back. So it's really just a, a terrible afterload problem. So it would make sense to me that treating the afterload would be very helpful in, in you know, delaying this progression and even mortality saving. So another question here, would you add a second agent to IV prostacycline in the therapy to the uh, patient that you were shown, uh, Deanna, as an example. Yes. So uh, in general, what I do is IV process cyclones are tough medicines to take. If anybody's ever had any experience with patients with, on IV process cyclones, they have tons of side effects. And in reality, we don't know how much IV process cyclone is enough. Um, so now that with the cardiomems, we're getting a better, clear idea of the effect on pulmonary pressures and when to stop. But what I always do is if a patient is going to go on IV process cyclones, I don't put any oral therapy on because IV process cyclones are very vasodilating until I'm at the max dose of IV process cyclones. And, and the max dose is dictated by the patient. They'll tell you that I can't take any more of this stuff. So we stop titrating. And then I, I'll add on the, the PD-5 inhibitor and the ERA just so I, so I maximize the IV process cyclone first and save all my bl blood pressure room for them. And then I can, I can put on oral therapy. But certainly in the perfect world, at the end of the day, they're on triple therapy, combination of all three. I have to add here uh, as a comment, do not do this on your own, guys. Uh, yeah, I don't have, try this at home. I have seen that uh, uh, first time a patient with a prostacycline infusion pump uh, where the pump was disconnected for a few seconds. And that patient syncopized like in a matter of uh, five to 10 seconds. It's extremely short acting and extremely significant withdrawal. Uh, with uh, with ibuprostocycline. Yeah, um, in the early days question. when with the original form formulations of epiprosinol, which only had a half life of about four to six minutes, there there was a lot of lot of mortality when when patients would abruptly stop the infusion for whatever reason. 
Um, now the half life is about four to six hours, but still it's a very scary thing. The rebound of pulmonary hypertension, people die like this. Um, is there any evidence for the difference in using uh, a direct uh, uh, GC agonist uh, like uh, Adempas versus PD-5 or likewise uh, different IV protocycling, remodeling versus Flolan? Yeah, so for remodeling of the RV function? I assume. Yeah, so remodeling. So, you know, the there's not a whole lot of data for RV remodeling. And I think the problem is we don't have any great standardized metrics. Now in the era of MRI and advanced echo techniques, I think we're gonna to start to see some data, but there's no data looking at direct remodeling as an effect for mortality. So, but I think, you know, this is really, this is really where the field is going. Cause it's, it's you know, the, the attention has to be paid to RV function and structure. And without a great metric of measuring that, I don't think that there's any data that one is better than the other for remodeling. So in, in, in chronic CTEPH, um, we often, uh, I, I've read that you often see uh, vascular changes in the um, territories that are not affected by the uh, emboli themselves. So there's some reaction probably to increase flow in the, in the quote unquote healthy vascular bed. Um, does those change your reverse once you do a pulmonary embolectomy? Or in other words, yeah, do you yeah, so do an embolectomy? Yeah, so what you're describing these kind of these webs that you see in uh, it's very kind of classic sign of advanced, you know, in CTEF and things like that, where you see this these web like formations of, of hypervasculature and they do regress over time. But you know, again, these 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 surgeries are not easy to do and they really need to be a very complete distal uh, thrombectomies, uh, because a lot of the pro time, the problem is really distally where there's tons of microclots. And if those might even, you know, a couple microclots left behind that infl inflammatory propagation is still there. So it has to be done well, but we do see regression and an almost immediate drop in PA pressures post-op, which is really, uh, you know, very satisfying to see. So Jeremy is asking, uh, with pulmonary arterial hypertension treated with all these advanced therapies, have you seen better outcomes uh, on certain subset of patients, for, for example, HIV versus lupus? I think we're talking about uh, type 1. Uh, yeah, so the best prognosis patients in group 1 that we have are those with portal pulmonary hypertension. And it reverses extremely quickly. And most of the time you don't need IV therapy. It's just on a little bit of oral therapy and that reverses very well. So that's a really important entity that I like to find and it's very easy to treat. I have to say the worst class is still mixed connective tissue disease and HIV is somewhere in the middle along with idiopathic and, and, um, and, and other you know, genetic uh, pulmonary hypertensions. But there's, you know, as it stands since 1980, we know that the connective tissue disease people do the worst portal pulmonary patients generally do the best. And partly part of that is that most of those go on to liver transplants once we lower the PA pressure. So that completely disappears with liver transplant. So that's, um, that, that's what I can say about the prognostic uh, data in, in the, the various phenotypes. So final question, uh, Sandia, the, 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 the disease and the interest that you and I have in common, that colic heart failure, um, in this patient with uh, heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction, we know that there's a subset in which pulmonary pressures are out of proportion to the wedge. So uh, let's say like the case that you presented with a you know, RV pressure of 95 over 50, but a wedge of 25 rather than five. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so many treatments have been tried there uh, with the hope that they would work, but so far nothing seems to pan out. What, what's your opinion on how to manage this patient? Okay, so this is really kind of the dreaded combined pre and post capillary hypertension phenotype. So this is, this is described as a mean PA over 20 with a wedge over 15 with a PVR over three. So what, they're, what we're really trying to to distinguish is those are the patients who you know the mean PA just clinically you feel that is much higher than what the wedge elevation is. But 
I think the biggest fallacy in all these trials with the HEFPEP population is that there was not sufficient LA unloading, meaning that if you never bring the left atrial pressure down to 10, 15, you will never have any success with pulmonary directed therapy, pulmonary vasodilator therapy. So I think there's still hope, but we need to do a better job. And perhaps with cardio MEMS and things like that, there's we will make sure that we try therapy only after the patients are, are optimally unloaded. So you have to bring the LA pr pressure down. And I think the LA, LA hypertension is really a big driver of why all these pH trials have failed with HEFPEP. Well, terrific. Uh, thank you again for um, giving us a superb uh, lecture and to make a topic that is so difficult, uh, probably one of the most difficult topics in cardiovascular medicine. Uh, relatively easy to understand. And uh, guys, you know, uh, and girls, you know, who do you have to send your patients when, when, when you find out uh, or when you suspect these patients uh, with uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Have a, all have a very good weekend. And uh, remember, we will continue this uh, series in two weeks from now. Uh, we'll uh, send you uh, uh, some advanced uh, notification to all of you. And for those of you who um, may want to um, see this uh, uh, again or for the first time, they will reside in our uh, YouTube channel. Thank you, everybody.